Uh, our next speaker is actually Dr. Sharon, excuse me, Dr. Sharon Lewin. She is the founder and executive director of the Lewin Fund. Sharon, thank you for joining us. And, and also Sharon is part of our uh, Myriad Genetics, one of our sponsors. Are you unmuted, Sharon? We can't hear you. There, Sharon. You're still muted. We can't hear you. Brett, did you make sure on the presenter? Yes. Okay. I can't mute or unmute her right now. So that means Sharon, you're muted on your own. Nope, still can't hear you. At the very bottom, Sharon, it pops up. That says mic and camera. See if that very bottom you can unmute. Make sure the mic is green. Yeah, make sure your mic is green. Oh, Sharon, you were going to use your phone. Oh, take it back. Rick, how can she use her phone for dialing in? Okay, she she just uh, she just dials in on the uh, dialing connection number. If somebody can put that in the screen for her, and she uses, I forget it. Um, the the meeting code is two 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 five eight three nine seven three, and the dialing number here. I'll I'll put it in there is okay. um, six four six. Seven four nine three one two nine. It's in there. Is it in there? Thank you. Good yeah, job. I just put it in right above it. Thank you, thank you. So if she if she dials in on that number and um, puts in that meeting code, she'll come right into the meeting, and then she can just uh, continue to share her screen the way she's done. Do that from your phone, Sharon. All right, we can you hear us? Okay, I there can hear are. you. Can you hear me? We can oh, hear good. you now. I, Excellent. I'm so I'm so sorry for some it's reason right. it was muted on the phone line, but um, at any rate, I really apologize. Not a problem. We welcome you and thank so, you for taking the time. We'll thank you, you Peggy. Thank you, Brett. It's so nice to see you and so many other familiar faces. Hope you are all doing well in Kansas City. Uh, I was really hoping to be there in person. You know, it's my hometown, so I always love to see all my uh, Kansas City friends and family. But um, thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to speak today. I will be very brief. My name is Sharon Lewin. I'm a gynecologic oncologist. I have been very interested in hereditary genetics for pretty much my entire career, well over 20 years. I had the fortune to train at Sloan Kettering and spent a lot of time with really some of the premier oncologists and geneticists, and that's when I really fell in love with this topic. 
if we really want to hit the highlights in just a few minutes about why hereditary cancers are important, is that we do know identifying patients for testing has really now become much easier. And I'm amazed all the people that I see who have a family history of male breast cancer who really do not know that that is a big red flag for genetic testing. So if any of you or any of your family members, of course, have a personal history of male breast cancer, that definitely qualifies for genetic testing. You know, now when we look at the national guidelines, whether it's NCCN, which is the National Comprehensive Cancer Network, or ASCO, the American Society of Clinical Oncology, we do know that identifying patients for genetic testing has really become a lot easier. If you have a personal history of breast cancer at any age, if you're a man or a woman, that now definitely qualifies for genetic counseling. Testing for sure actually is for males, regardless of any other family history or age, and the majority of women with breast cancer at any age definitely need counseling, and a majority will also qualify for testing too. If you have family history of ovarian cancer at any age, now metastatic prostate cancer at any age, pancreatic cancer at any age, or if you have colon or endometrial cancer under the age of 65, or what's called a PREM score. It's a little bit of a sophisticated modeling, which is pretty much any woman under 65 with endometrial cancer, man under 65 with colon cancer. A personal history of this definitely qualifies for genetic testing. When we're looking at family members, now it's important that according to NCCN, we look at family members, first, second, and third degree relatives. So it's actually a very big pedigree that we're looking at. ASCO requires that we look at just at least and a minimum first and second degree relatives. But if you have a family history of any of these things, and I'm happy to give you these slides for handouts or just to send them along electronically, if you have breast cancer under the age of 50, that now meets criteria for testing. And again, looking at least at first and second degree relatives or first, second, and third degree relatives. If you have two breast cancers in one relative at any age, three or more breast cancers and relatives on the same side of the family. Again, any family history of ovarian, metastatic prostate, pancreatic cancer, um, or mel breast cancer at any age, that definitely meets criteria for testing. Colon, rectal, or endometrial cancer diagnosed under the age of 50. If you're Jewish um, and have breast cancer at any age, that also meets criteria, or a family history of breast cancer at any age, that meets criteria and of course, a previously identified mutation in the family. So we do know that these criteria are constantly changing and that's why it's always a good idea and a good opportunity to talk about these criteria because people who maybe did not meet criteria in the past important to test. So why is it important to test? We do know that there is individualized medical management we can accurately stratify your risk, and it does alleviate a lot of uncertainty and anxiety. So we do know that there is a significant risk of breast cancer for both men and women if you do have a BRCA mutation, for example. That's not the cause of all cases of breast cancer, but we certainly wanna to try to eradicate and identify any of these genetic or hereditary causes. If someone does have a family history that's high risk or a genetic mutation, we can employ increased screening and surveillance to hopefully prevent these cancers or prophylactic surgery, for example, um, or emo, even chemoprophylaxis, but there are a lot of different options to help prevent these cancers. So I just wanna say it's very important to be your own health advocate, really know your family history, speak to your doctor or genetic counselor. Unfortunately, we see that a lot of doctors are not speaking to patients about their family and personal history. So it's important that you ask who has had cancer, what cancers and what ages, uh, because we really would love to stomp out any of these hereditary cancers. Of course, really employ healthy lifestyles. We now know, for example, in the United States, there's new data that obesity is one of the major risk factors for cancer. It's associated with about 13 different types of cancers. So there's one article after another about the importance, which has been very important during COVID and very difficult to eat healthy, stay in an ideal body weight, exercise, limit alcohol, very, very important to prevent cancer as well as prevent cancer recurrence. So Leslie, you this want to find out- This conference will now be recorded.
if you want to find out if you are a candidate for genetic testing, here is a very easy link that you could go to. It's called mygenehistory.com. Um, you can even go to that and then you'll find the advanced women's health. But that allows you to put in your personal family history and see if you qualify for genetic testing. And then we can help find someone in your area. It's just either a blood test or saliva. Uh, really, there are no downsides to doing the test because pretty much everyone who meets this criteria is absolutely covered. Uh, you cannot lose your health insurance. There are congressional laws in place that protect patients and uh, state by state, but the majority of patients really cannot lose their life insurance either. So there's really no downside to doing the test. So certainly for men, if you have a family history of male breast cancer, if you have not had genetic testing, please do. You really need to have a full panel. So for those that have, might have had bracket testing in the past and that was negative, you really should now have an update test, an update panel where you're tested for all the genes because we have developed and discovered a lot of other genes that could put both men and women at high risk for breast and other cancers. With that, I think I'll uh, see if there are any questions. I could talk about this for hours, <laughs> but I know you have a wonderful lineup of speakers today. Well, that's all right. We, we love your knowledge. And uh, if you'll have actually share the slides back with me through an email, we'll have that available sure. for anybody. But yes, who has questions? That's perfect. We also now know there are a lot of therapeutic targets with something called PARP inhibitors, which you may have heard of, which are being used for men and women with breast cancer who have BRCA mutations. Also, it's being studied and utilized in pancreas and prostate cancers and ovarian cancers that are BRCA associated. So not only knowing the genetic status is important for treatment options, but of course to prevent secondary cancers in people, as well as prevent their family members from developing these cancers. I have a question. Yes. Um, when I was diagnosed, uh, I did receive genetic testing. I'm not sure if most of the guys in the group uh, received that or not, but I did. And um, I did not have BRCA, uh, that mutation, but I had something called BARD1. Uh, I wondered if you had heard about that because they told me that um, they just, they didn't know very much about it. And the only thing that it said in the report was that this gene mutation may cause increased cancer risk, but only in women. And that was kind of an odd thing to read. <laughs> um, so any, anyway, anything you might know about that. So was it the BRIP1, B-R-I-P? No, uh, B-A-R-D-1. BARD1, BARD1, okay. Well, you know, one of the things that we probably um, need to do a better job of globally is to talk more about breast cancer risk in men. Um, and because, you know, breast cancer in general in men is a lower incidence than in women, it definitely needs to receive a lot more attention and research, um, which is why kudos to your organization for really moving that needle forward. Um, I can actually get back to you and see whether or not BARD1 put you at risk for that male breast cancer. I'd have to get back to you on that. But I don't see why um, that wouldn't have been the cause for your breast cancer if it's a, a cause for female breast cancer as well, too. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. Um, it does make sense. So many, so many of these reports are tailored towards women, unfortunately, and we actually need to include the risks that are associated for men as well, too. Yes, and that's half of and, our battle. But we're winning. Look, look how you are winning, we are winning, guys. We are. <laughs> you definitely are winning. You know, I know when we see the reports with Lynch syndrome, we definitely talk about the risks of colon and other cancers for men and women both. But even with the BRCA genes, we really need to do a better job of specifying the risk for both men and women. We really do. Um, I can get back to you, though, about the specifics of breast cancer risk with BARD1. That's interesting. Wait, um, that's not a gene that, that is one of yeah, those that, higher moderate risks, but I can definitely get back to you. 
if you if you do Sharon if you do get information on that if you can get it to Peggy and myself um, we actually would be able to then put that out on our website and that that would be helpful okay perfect as well. um, I will and I was I was just reading in the chat box about sending you these slides which I will do that as well too absolutely thank you thank you I, it's that funny when you talk about this subject um, I actually sat in on a living beyond breast cancer um, meeting group here locally in New Jersey one time and I took one of our survivors with us Arnaldo Silva who actually had a, a BRCA mutation he received from his father who had received it from his grandfather and he's passed it on to his daughter and she, she now worries about her children and he sat in on the group with me he was the only man there were seven on seven or eight other women in the group um, all BRCA positive. And they went around the room and they told their stories. And after everybody's story had finished, they asked, um, you know, if I had any comments. And I said, honestly, sitting in as somebody, thank God, with, without breast cancer, but as somebody who represents all men, I said, I did find it very interesting that everyone, we have, with the exception of one woman in that room, received that BRCA mutation from their father. Yeah. Well, and it's it's very important that we talk about it because so often when we're taking these family histories, people only talk about the woman's side of the genes and and they really need to take the family history from both mom and dad's side of the family because right. obviously these genes are inherited half from mom and half from dad and people, you know, unfortunately still think these are women's genes which they're not. Mm -hmm. So it's very important yeah. that we continue to emphasize the importance of asking that in the in the male relatives as well. Yes, yep. we, we do that on a daily basis as we talk to new survivors. So we thank you. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much. Sherry, thank you so much. We thank you again, Dr. Well, for giving us your thank time. Thank you so much. My mm -hmm. pleasure. Anytime. Thank you.